welcome to the latest episode of the Dollar and Bandits. I'm Orrin Phillips, and before we start today's episode, I want to tell you guys about Ithacon, returning to Ithaca College, April 27th and 28th. Uh, get your tickets at, at Ithacon.org. Uh, guests in this year include our friend Don Simpson, Roger Stern, Walt Louise Simonson, and many more. I went to it last year. I had an absolute blast. It's an old school con. You're going to love it. Make sure you go check it out. So, our guest for today is one of the most prolific Daredevil writers in the history of the book. He's also written for Ghost Rider, Captain America, and many, many more. I'm talking about Roger McKenzie. Uh, Roger is one of the most creative people you are ever going to meet. His stories range from, you know, the, the supernatural to crime thrillers, to so many other different books that he's worked on. Uh, he was truly such a joy to talk to. It's one of those guys, again, we just sort of scratched the surface of what he's done. Uh, the nicest person in the world. Uh, I think you're going to love this interview. I know I love talking to him. Without further ado, Roger McKenzie. We have writer Roger McKenzie joining us. Thank you so much, sir, for taking the time. You're welcome. It's great to be here. So how did your comic book journey begin? How did you first discover comics? My dad discovered him for me in probably 1956 or thereabouts. Uh, he bought me my first comic. Um, I don't remember specifically. It was either Superman or Superboy. And um, I just started reading comics and, and loved them. And I was there when, when Marvel started, mm -hmm. you know, as Marvel. So I was there for the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man, Iron Man and Thor and, all, and and everything. And I was a diehard <laughs> Marvel fan. I just love those comics. And well, um, I spent growing up lots of summers in the basement on my, I convinced my folks to buy me a typewriter. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks listen will have no idea what a typewriter is. <laughs> <laughs> but this was long before computers, mm -hmm. you know. And um, they got me a little manual Smith Corona portable, mm -hmm. which I used until like 1989. Or, I wrote all the Marvel stuff on that, kind of typewriter. On that little portable typewriter with the carbon paper and the white out and, and all the rest of it but um, I spent summers mm -hmm. in the basement writing my big epic comic books which were terrible <laughs> <laughs> but you know I really wanted to and I couldn't I was never able to draw mm -hmm. not at all I could see it but from here to the paper it just wasn't happening. <laughs> so I started writing, and and you, the more you do, you, you kind of catch on. You kind of learn things. And I, I um, look, I, I don't remember now where I got it even. But there, um, before Stan Lee and and John Romita did the How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way, mm -hmm. Stan had done a little pamphlet, okay. a precursor that years before. And it showed how to lay out the format and, and what the penciler did and what the writer did and what the inker did mm -hmm. and laid all that out. So I learned the format there mm -hmm. and, and came up with all my great characters of the past, which were just ripoffs of, of Marvel characters. <laughs> but you learn as you go along. And, and thankfully, you know, I, I managed to get a little bit better. As, as the years went by, <laughs> got into, you know, started college, mm -hmm. wife, kind of put the comic books aside. Mm -hmm. um, third year, finished my third year, university, ran out of money. So, I said, okay, I'll take a semester or two off and and get a, a full-time job and, and save money up and, and go back to school in a year. So, well, I got a job that, that I just hated. Oh, it was terrible. But, you know, you work to put, put food on the table and do mm -hmm. all that. One weekend, I was rooting around in my closet for something. And 
Wait, there's that little typewriter. Sitting in this little case. I said, why not try? Because I've been now I've been reading, you know, creepy since it started. Mm -hmm. Warren publishing creepy year of emperor. Well, I was what I, I had always loved the Warren publishing, mm -hmm. and I thought since they used all kinds of different writers and artists, maybe I'd have a chance there. So I spent a weekend, wrote a story, mailed it off, and forgot about it. About three months or so later, I got a letter back from, from Wheezy Jones. Now, Wheezy Simonson. Yes. Wheezy Simonson. And um, he says, you know, we don't usually buy stuff sight unseen, you know. And, but um, she said, we like your story. We'd like to buy it. And there was a check in there. Seventy dollars. Wow. Now that's not much today. That's a whole lot in nineteen seventy four. Yep. And she said, You got any more? I was thinking, Oh, I can keep this job that I hate. Or <laughs> I can not come. Now what am I gonna do? <laughs> well we start I started writing it and saving up. You know, I, I found a better full-time job gotcha. that I really liked. So I had my full-time job, mm -hmm. and I do the Warren stuff like on the weekends and in the evenings if if I, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'd called Marvel in D.C. at the time. Now, this would have been 76, mm -hmm. thereabouts. And at that time, you had to live in New York or close by before they'd even talk to you. Cause you know, they needed you there to be in the office so they can, can conduct business, mm -hmm. you know, perfectly understands long before email and, and zoom like we're doing and all the rest of it. So I saved, I saved the Warren money. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, a year or so, afterwards and I, I continued to write the orange i'd saved up money i said well now i can make my way to new york so i did and stayed in a little a little hotel kind of in the shadow of, of the empire state building okay. and it was really neat because each floor you know right up the, this old rickety elevator each floor had a different um different population and every time you go up, you might go past the the India floor, mm -hmm. and you get all the the, the Indian India food, mm -hmm. the Mexican, you know, and so on. It's just all ethnic yeah. stuff all the way up to me and my little typewriter in my little room with my little hot plate. <laughs> so I'm going. This is this is really great, you know. And and I was walking distance to Warren and 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 DC and Marvel. So I continued to to do the stuff at Warren and started palling around at, at DC, you know, and and talking to the editors and stuff. And I actually got hired at DC first as their proofreader. Worst proofreader they ever had. <laughs> worst. Gotta be. I gotta hold the record for the worst one. <laughs> uh, page three. I was no longer a proofreader. I was a fan looking mm -hmm. at this art. Oh, wow. You know, you go through, you, you, you read the, you know, we're not looking at the book. We're looking at the actual pages. Mm -hmm. You go through and go, wow. And you realize, wait, I didn't actually really proof it. So I had to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I started picking up work then at DC, then uh, Weird War Tales and then some of their, their, you know, um, monster books. And that's kind of my, was my bailiwick at the time. Mm -hmm. And I started pestering Marvel. Mm -hmm. And I walk over Marvel. And um, Flo Steinberg, greatest, greatest front office person ever in the whole world. Mm -hmm. um, once she realized that you were in the comic book community, 
you you'd walk in the office, you go, hey, Rog, and buzz you back. You don't have to wait and, and go through. You just, and so I could wander up and down the halls of Marvel. And at that time, Archie Goodwin was the editor in chief. I pestered Archie to death. <laughs> Till he, he finally gave me a five page Havoc story, one of the X Men characters mm -hmm. to write. Went back to my little room in the ethnic hotel with the little. I guess I spent a week. I must have written that thing 50 or 60 times. <laughs> <laughs> I finally got it to where I thought it was okay. Mm. And what we were supposed to do at that time, and, and Archie had shown me, mm. we would uh, write the script. But when the art came back, mm. they would put a, like a, a piece of vellum paper over the, the artwork. And I would put in where the dialogue was supposed to go the the word balloons and the captions and stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's another week. Wow. <laughs> I had no clue what I was doing. <laughs> so I finally take this stuff in and 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 Archie's sitting at his desk and I say, you know, here and Archie kind of looks at it. You know, and you can lift the vellum up to see the the original art. Mm -hmm. so he kind of looked at it lift that up, he look at it, and he put it back down. He look at it. He finally looked at me and says, sit down, I want to show you how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> the editor-in-chief wow. took like a half an hour, 45 minutes out of his time to show this, this kid that just fell off the turnip truck how to do word balloons. That's awesome. <laughs> sent me off with and came back and, and then it was apparently okay. Now, as far as I know, that story was never published. Oh, okay. So I presume it's long lost yeah. by now. I don't even remember who the artist was, but I think it might have been Mike Golden. Okay. But I'm not, that's a guess. Yeah. Oh. And um, then from there, um. Now, Jim Shooter was the, the assistant editor mm -hmm. at the time, and he was writing at least Daredevil and Ghost Rider at the time, along with his full-time duties, you know, carrying the water there at Marvel, and it became too much for him. So mm -hmm. I got a call from Archie one day and said, do you want to write Ghost Rider and Daredevil? Well, I had to ponder that for like one microsecond. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> <Well>, yeah. <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> so that launched my Marvel career. And I wasted a lot of your time with all this. Oh, no, not at all. It's awesome. That, that's how I don't know how people today get hired at Marvel and DC. Yeah. I don't think they went the route I went. Probably. I don't think it's it's too much of a business now. Mm -hmm. It was a it was literally at Marvel and at DC more so at Marvel, but certainly at DC. I made lots of good friends at DC. Yeah. It was more of a family. That's why I was here. Yeah. And it was a business. I want to ask quickly about oh. Warren because as a young writer, were they? hands-on or hands-off when it came to helping shape your writing and giving you advice and editorial advice or they just kind of leave you to do what you wanted mostly left me alone um wheezy was a, a great editor mm -hmm. just loved her stuff and um the way it worked i would you know come up with with an idea and then do a little short two or three paragraph thing or just call and say hey i want to do this and that mm -hmm. and she liked it she said okay cool mm -hmm. um more times than i care to remember and and bruce had the same problem bruce jones mm -hmm. i will call with this great idea and she said yeah bruce has already come up with that one <laughs> years later he told me he you know in quotes, he hated me because he said every time I came up with a good idea, she'd say, Mackenzie's already done. <laughs> but we went back and forth like that for years. Mm -hmm. But um, it was mostly hands off. 
mm-hmm. which was was for the new the new guy was kind of good and kind of bad. Um, good in the way that I got to do what I wanted to do. Well, I guess good and good actually, because then what I envisioned, the artists always came through. It matter they always they had great artists mm-hmm. at Warren. But I would see that things that I wrote, which sounded really good in my mind, didn't really work on on the the page because early on, I wrote way too many words, mm-hmm. and you know how you kind of would go from from a a word balloon that would start in one panel and and go to the next one. Mm-hmm. I was doing that along with captions that were doing the same thing. Gotcha. What a mess. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how you learn. Right. I don't know if I've ever done a story that once it's printed and I'm looking at it, I'm, I, I always go, why didn't I do it this way? I think when you reach the point where you don't do that, you might as well quit. Right. When you're creating a character... Where do you start? Is it a name? Is it a look, a, a, a physical characteristic, a, an ability? Where do you start when you're building up a character? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All of that. It it sometimes just happens. With me, more times than not, what will stir or, or spark the idea mm-hmm. is just some offhanded remark. Okay. You know, when I go, that sounds kind of cool. And then, you know, either you, you, you get the idea right away or it, I guess subconsciously you kind of file it away. Mm. Put it in your, in your file cabinet in your mind. And at some point in time, something else hits. You go, well, wait, that'll work. But I have never sat down and said, today I'm going to create this character or this it, it's always been an organic sort of a deal with me. Now that doesn't mean that once that idea is there, it's completely finished and everything's done and all is great. Because mm-hmm. you've got it's more like a little acorn. And you kind of build on that. But the original concepts are usually just happen. And I think that might have been the training I had from Warren because almost all the Warren stories are based off the EC like titles. You know, EC had great titles. Yep. You know, on there. Tank the meat, it's hum it's the humanity mm-hmm. sort of thing. <laughs> and you know, I would work more times than not, I would work backwards from the the story title at Warren to actually constructing how do I make the story work that makes the the title of the story work and, and that's basically how i did the mar- you know the, the worn stuff and i think it kind of bled over into doing the, the characters mm-hmm. you know i'm curious about horror comics because you know i i would read some of the dc the ghosts or the dell comics about stuff like right. that and it was kind of like it's like pasta there's three ingredients and you can make it looks different ways but you know somebody was wronged a ghost comes back they get uh-huh. revenge either on a bad person or innocent people help this ghost out. And then you just sort of change the pieces around and you add some folks here and there, but it's basically the same ingredients. How do you sort of break that up and do original kind of horror stories? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think the, the ones that you mentioned pretty much were more editor driven. Mm-hmm perhaps then then writer driven at that point. Um, With me, it was just, is this a kind of an interesting deal? And although you you kind of want to have the the big snappy surprise ending Mm -hmm. that twists everything around, that becomes a cliche too at some point. Mm -hmm. Because if you know that's coming because it's coming in every story, (laughs) <laughs> well you know, but uh i don't have any real solid answers on that although now i never paid much attention mm-hmm. 
to the Gold Keys and, and, and the DCs, mm -hmm. they weren't horrific enough for me. Because the first time I ever was exposed, I was a, a small town Southern boy. Mm -hmm. We had one, one Rexall drugstore that had a spinner rack of comics. That's where I got my comics. Yeah. When I, I had never ever heard of Frank Frazetta or Jack Davis, right. Williamson, any of these guys. So now this was back, when did, I'm not even sure when Warren started with Creepy Number One. Was 60, it, was it in the 60s? I believe in the 50s, late 50s or 60s. But uh, well, it was later than 50s. I know it's got, it had to be in the 60s. Oh, yeah. But um, for a a kid that had never seen these guys, I was absolutely blown away. Because yeah. I think, now were those a quarter or 35 cents? I'm not too sure. One of those two things. Hmm. When comic books were a dime, that's two and a half comic books. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, I was such a comic book nerd. Um, <laughs> School lunches were 30 cents a day. So my mom and dad gave me a buck and a half for my school. Guess who didn't eat lunch? <laughs> I had 15 comics. Good for you. Uh, you when you get home. Marvel and DC destroyed my financial empire when they went to 12 cents. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I always liked the, the Warren stuff. Mm -hmm. much better than Dumb. you know and, and it's uh, two different markets i mean i'm not putting putting you know the gold keys and 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 but they had a a different marketing mm -hmm. strategy and a different market i, I presume younger kids mm -hmm. were looking at that. and i had no i had at that time no clue that there was ever an ec comics right. line now mad was still around mm -hmm. but i think ec got uh wiped out in, in like 1955. So right before I started actually reading comics, they were gone. Yep. I had no clue <laughs> when I found those and they did some phenomenal work, Yeah, you know? And unfortunately, of course, they brought in all the, the imitators, mm -hmm. you know, that really did some icky. Yeah. I mean, horror is horror, but when it's just, blood and guts and you know the precursor of the slasher films yeah pretty much yep so eh, you know and the comics code authority came along mm -hmm. i actually had my uh, daredevil story really unimproved by the comic code so yeah you know, the the child's play story uh, me and frank did with the mm -hmm. with the the angel dust yeah the drug story mm-hmm Oh, the first time around, Comics Code Authority said no. So what happens in that situation? Uh, Marvel kind of put that on hold. And uh, between when we did that and the end of my career at Marvel, mm -hmm. which long water under the bridge, so, mm -hmm. you know. But um, eventually they just kind of said, you know, the heck with it. And just publish it anyway. Yeah. I want so, to. Oh, I no, you go ahead. I, I was. Just, I just wanted to jump back to to Ghost Rider for a second because uh -huh. when you get assigned that book, uh, is there a sense of nervousness that okay, now you're sort of jumping into this title, and how, what kind of research did you do on the book before you started writing? For Ghost Rider. Um, that was interesting because that one I wasn't hugely familiar with. So, you know, well, Marvel's got all the books there. So you just kind of grab them and, and, and read them. You read the books and mm -hmm. kind of go from there. And, um, but that's one they kind of was, was in the forefront. Now, when I got um, Daredevil and later Captain America, as I understand it, they were ready to be discontinued. They were ready for the axe. Wow. 
and they kind of gave it to the new kids. So let's train him on these because they don't mean anything and and you know they're 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 pretty much history. Mm -hmm. Well not to me they weren't. These are guys I grew up with. Mm -hmm. I was reading Daredevil permission number one. And the first Captain America I ever saw. Now I forget the the issue number, but it was in the Strange Tales when the acrobat was was the pretend Captain America and mm -hmm. had the Captain outfit, and and he leaps like from the stands, and you know it's great Jack Kirby Captain America leaping. Mm -hmm. My jaw didn't just hit the floor, it hit the floor and bounced up and hit the floor again. <laughs> I was sold. Now, Daredevil and Cap were my two favorite um, Marvel characters. Mm -hmm. I never was drawn to actually want to do the team books. Okay. Or or even I, I, like at DC, I never really wanted to do Superman. I liked the more <laughs> down to earth. Mm -hmm. Superhero, you know what? Well, you know, Cap and then all oh, Daredevil's a blind guy with a stick. Right. Yeah, he can, <laughs> he can tell you how many grains of sand are on a pretzel. <laughs> I'm sure that's going to stop Doctor Octopus. <laughs> I, I know how many grains of sand are on that. <laughs> but you know, it, and you you take things and 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 you just kind of go with them now. Nobody was paying any attention to Daredevil when I took it over, except for Jim. Mm -hmm. um, I started with 157, I believe. Now, and he handed me the artwork, mm -hmm. which was already done by Gil Kane. Okay. The issue before it was already on the stands. Now, you usually have like a three-month buffer in there. And it was kind of like, we need this last week. <laughs> okay, then. So I did the best I could, and, and Jim liked it. And, you know, it was on from there, and, and we started building momentum, and then all of a sudden, everybody started getting interested. No. And, and um, I was able... Because Gene was wanting to to more or less retire. And he was tired. I mean, he'd been on Daredevil forever. Mm -hmm. So you might notice in those are issues. He would draw some and, and there'd be other artists and, and all this. Because we didn't have a regular established artist. Mm -hmm. But um, every month I kind of twist his arm. And, Just one more. <laughs> Just one more. And it was... He just he wouldn't abandon his his child. Yeah. So yeah, he he did another one. Now one thing about Gene, and I've had this happen before, but and I've worked with many mm. super terrific artists, but now Gene, as far for me, was the absolute best. Mm. And we did marble style. We do the synopsis, and then he draw the. The, the pencils and and I put in the, the dialogue and stuff. No matter what, and, and my synopsis has turned out to be like short stories. Mm -hmm. I it wasn't it, it never wasn't and it, it isn't now. I can't sit there and go. Daredevil swings across the city. Daredevil looks this way you now. <laughs> I start writing the story, and all of a sudden the dialogues. So I'm putting dialogue in there so I'll remember it. You know when I'm when I'm doing the pages later on, and but every time Gene would draw a story, it would come back better than what I gave him. Not that he changed it, because right. he didn't. He never missed what I call the money shot, mm -hmm. the angle, the expression, a hundred percent every single time. But um, and at DC, I'd worked with with Frank on a Weird War Tales. Mm -hmm. It was like a two page story about roaches. <laughs> 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 and uh, I lobbied for 
a good amount of time to get them to take a look at Frank's stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, let's get this guy on boy, he's pretty darn good. Yeah. At the time he was heavily um influenced by Gil Kane. Okay. And and then they peel around, peel around, you know. But finally they said okay, and then although we've gotten Daredevil back up to respectable standards, once Frank came on, it was like a booster rocket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so off we went. And then all of a sudden everybody cared. Right. <laughs> Everybody, you know, was watching this with the, you know, it was just, it was kind of, I couldn't really get by with a lot of stuff I got by with her because I, I wanted him to be, I never liked the fact that he was a second rate Spider-Man. Okay. Never liked that aspect, you know, wisecracking kind of guy. I wanted him to be more of a, a devil. Let's make him be fearful. I, you know, channeling Batman. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to ask you was what do you what was an ingredient missing from the character? And you and you just said it right there. He was kind of, you know, a wise guy. He'd have sort of like a villain of the week and you know, he'd be fighting the guy and say some funny quips and then you yeah. know, go on with his day. Yeah. Was, when you made that sort of decision to 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 change the character, were like you said, nobody was really watching, but was there any kind of pushback to be like, wait, you know, we don't no, know. No, absolutely I'm... not. Okay. So we just started doing it. And I don't think I did it like all at once. Okay. Not that I had this great scheme that I'd, you know, pull the wool over their eyes. It just kind of like built upon itself, mm -hmm. you know, as you start, you know, doing your own stories. Right. You know, because I certainly couldn't do that with the story that that uh, Jim Shooter had written, and the guild already drawn. They're not going to redraw it when we're already behind the eight ball. Because yeah. you got to understand, I, you probably know this, but, but a lot of folks listening may not, and I presume it's still this way today. Um, their books go to these big web presses. At that time, it was in Dixon, Illinois, I believe. Now they use Canada a lot and and, and foreign you know, printers, but there's these big web presses like they print newspapers on. Mm -hmm. And the comic book industry, they have to buy time on these presses. Right. Now, if you don't have a book there, that's too darn bad. You still owe them. That's why you would see a lot of reprint books. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, they had to have something to put in that time that they'd already purchased yeah or else they've just thrown their money away it, it's funny you mention that because i interviewed mr shooter and he was saying that when he sort of took over that the company was really hemorrhaging a lot of money because of missed deadlines and stuff like I that would, but they were paying money left and right for things that weren't coming out and yeah. before he came in it was kind of like eh, you know it happens but then he sort of really tried to tighten it up so they weren't losing that kind of money mm -hmm. well yeah I mean, that only makes good financial sense. I mean, what you, you know, and, and as a freelancer, mm -hmm. well, if they're bleeding money, I may find that I'm not getting as much work or I'm not getting a page rate increase. Right. You know, you don't want them to be wasting money. Yeah. At least I wouldn't wouldn't want to. And you <laughs> no. want to make a profit. I mean, and of course, then as it becomes more and more of a corporation, then you've got shareholders and exactly. folks, you know, that you have a fiduciary responsibility, mm -hmm. you know, to them and board of directors and all the rest of it. With, with uh, Daredevil and also with Captain America, how far ahead are you thinking story-wise? Uh, you... Three stories ahead, do you see an arc coming to an end, or do you just kind of go issue by issue by issue and just kind of roll from there? Uh, it it kind of depends. Um, and I was never real good at figuring out what's going to happen six issues down the road. Okay. Now, if you've got like a, a little short story arc, of the, I would kind of have an idea of either the start or the end. But um, I find 
when I'm writing, and then this this may be me, but when I'm writing a story, the characters kind of tell me where we're going, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. If I try to make them do this, usually by the middle of the story, mm -hmm. nothing's coming. It's it's something's you know, and it's like you hit this block, and and invariably, if mm -hmm. you go back, you go, oh wait, sure. all right, he wanted to do this, mm -hmm. and so it was kind of like I might start off with an idea for for where we're going to be three issues from now, but when we get to that three issue mark, we're over here somewhere, and it it works for me. Yeah. Yeah, some guys, some guys I know, they will sit down and they will have every duck lined up in a row. I, I, I can never do that. <laughs> and I'm not saying, you know, well, gee, I'm so great, I don't have to. It's no. just that's not my personality. Thanks, so. I want to ask you a question about your relationship with Mr. Miller because we hear some things where writers and artists. You know, as fans, we think, oh, you guys are sitting in a room together. You're bouncing ideas back and forth. But it's, from a lot of the folks we've spoken to, sometimes the writer doesn't even speak to the artist. They just sort of get the art back. They do their thing and they never really have any kind of interaction. What was your relationship like, not only with Mr. Miller, but with other artists as well? Um, it runs the gamut, depending on, well, like most of the Warren artists mm -hmm. were um, in the Philippines. Okay. So yeah, you just send the script in and and you know the art would come back and mm. Wheezy would show me the, you know, the art and I go, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um Frank and I were pretty good friends. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a backstory and and I know we talked um, at the beginning if there's stuff I don't want to really get into. Right. Well, that would be definitely uh but uh, yeah, um, uh, Frank and I—he lived not too far. Okay. From me at the time, so we would we would go out and you know kind of get a pitcher of beer at the pub and mm -hmm. sit around and and shoot the breeze about you know Daredevil and this and that. And now I want to jump a little bit ahead um, to your time with Pacific with Sunrunners, which you know is I just read the Pacific comics. Uh, Companion put up by Tomorrow's Publishing. Um, and I, at first, I just want to get your opinion on Pacific Comics. What was your experience like? Because it sounded like their heart was in the right place, but maybe business-wise, things didn't line up maybe as they should. Uh, I think that's pretty much, you know, the way it was. I never had any, any you know, um, issues, mm -hmm. per se. Now, um I think at the time, and it wasn't wouldn't have been exclusive with me, but um, you know they had the distribution arm at that time too, right. and I I think maybe the distribution arm was kind of propping up the the publishing mm -hmm. end of it, but um, you know sometimes checks would be late, yeah, stuff like, but those things happen, yeah. But uh, I got I've got nothing really really bad or disparaging to say about Pacific or any of those guys. No, definitely. You know, because um, I thought they 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 put out some good stuff, and although it didn't come to pass, and it may be because of those business reasons, mm -hmm. um, we had talked about me writing a series at Jack Kirby was going to be doing wow and we went out to his to his home out in thousand oaks and i got to spend the afternoon with jack and, and Roz. Mm -hmm. and um if you could see what i saw hanging on his walls <laughs> if you thought his comic book stuff was something yeah wow i was gonna say because here you are like you said a comic book nerd we were just talking about his Jack Kirby, Captain America uh, right. art. And all of a sudden, here you are talking to the man himself in his house with his art. How did you keep your composure and stay on target? 
Well, I appreciate the fact that you think I did. <laughs> <laughs> and as, well far as, talking, as far as talking, I think I was probably just mumbling some sort of sure. caveman. Um, <laughs> I, I, I tried this with Stan because I got to meet Stan in the office. Yeah. And I tried it with Jack. I tried to be professional. And I, I held out for all, I'd say, a good two seconds. Oh, there you go. And then I'm gushing, you know, oh, this is that. But at that time, now, Jack was not in, in the greatest of health mm. even then. But uh, we sat down and he started to explain his stuff. And it was like, you asked me where I come up with my ideas and do they do. He was like, one panel, we'll do this. And then he's off on this other tangent immediately. And, I, and I'm thinking, wait, now this this is like a three-story thing. <laughs> and it's bang, 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 bang. Yeah. He was so creative, even in his, his you know, mm -hmm. end of his career. It was just phenomenal. Do you think it would have been difficult to work with him because if he is like that for you to sort of try to harness or focus an uh, idea to try to get into a story i think it would and i think it would would also be because here's a guy who has done this all his life and has done it before i was born who am i to tell him what to do and that's totally understandable um i would try to you know ha had this thing come to pass i would try to stay within whatever margins he wanted me to be in but mm -hmm. i would think it would be somewhat difficult yeah i want to jump into sunrise for a second but i'm wondering being able to do a comic of your own creation with pacific did you need that after being at marvel to be able to get it in out of your system or, or just to, to re sort of refresh yourself to create your own work without a thousand different eyes on it, sort of maybe, you know, putting parameters on what you can and can't do. Um, yeah, a little bit of, of both of that. Cause I was, was um, no longer getting employment at Marvel. Mm -hmm. You see now at this time too, and, and I don't think a lot of folks realize this. Um, I was severely diabetic and didn't know it. Wow. I mean, we're talking big time problems were right on the horizon as far as as, as neuropathy and and later on some some heart troubles and mm -hmm. vision problems, all the stuff that goes. I had no clue. The only person I know of in my family was like a third cousin who was a juvenile diabetic. Right. I had no experience with it. Um it started with with my feet started going down, but uh, and at the time I was trying to do, you know, the Sunrunner stuff because a I needed, I wanted to write still, and you know, and not to sound like boy I'm going to hack this stuff out, well, but you got to live too, yeah, and this is what I knew, mm -hmm. and and these were kind of some ideas that and Next Man too, what were kind of ideas that I'd had for a while and wanted to do, but I didn't want to do them at Marvel at that time because, you know, and and Neil Adams was spearheading a lot of this creator owned stuff and then returning the artwork and all this stuff. And I was certainly on board with that. Most definitely. So yeah, it was kind of like, yeah, I want to do my own thing now. Right. And and it's kind of stayed that way ever since. I was gonna say. How does uh, Pat Broderick get uh, put into the picture for uh, Sunrunners? Uh, we had worked on a um, story or two. I know we did a Thor and Captain Marvel mm -hmm. book and um, liked his stuff a lot. I said, let's get Pat doing it. And Pat's, you know, he's pretty cool. I would say Pat Broderick, uh, he's one of those artists that I think more people should know his name because... Yeah. His stuff, it, it's even today, he's yeah. with Mike Barron, it's absolutely beautiful. Like he doesn't miss a beat. Yeah, maybe even more so today. Yeah. I think he's just gotten better and better and better. Mm -hmm. 
So working with with sun runners, you said before that you know you don't want to think too far ahead with that story. Did you have a, a beginning and an end point in mind for the story? No, the not at story? all. Okay. And and those characters really changed, especially the elephant character, Doctor Gibraltar, who mm -hmm. turned out to be good at the occult. <laughs> <laughs> who knew? <laughs> and we had our. Our requisite mm -hmm. goofy robot. Yep. And you know, characters like that. It was just fun to do. Cause um it was it was certainly a case that at, at Pacific and Kamiko and in places mm -hmm. you did do your story. Right. Your I was pretty much, you know, the editor. Insofar as, as the, the creative material. Now, editors are really important. Mm -hmm. any freelancer should love an editor because editors are the ones that turns into pay vouchers there you go they get you a check <laughs> <laughs> no, the, 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 the Pacific guy and, and Kamiko and, and, and Eclipse and all now uh, the, the editors certainly play an important role right you know they got to keep the ship mm -hmm. afloat make sure you, well, you're, you're reasonably on time with this stuff because they've got deadlines too now i don't know if they have to purchase time or not being smaller mm -hmm. outfits but it always seemed like to me we had to try to do better because our cover price was always more than marvel and dc because it cost them more to print them because they're not printing as many the cost per unit was higher yeah on those I... kind of books but like like with sunrunners and um Next man too. Mm -hmm. I think we started out like at seventy thousand. Still at two dollars a pop. That wasn't bad. And I like you said before, you know, for two dollars a pop, then you might be able to get. I think books are maybe fifty to seventy five cents at the time. Probably, yeah. So you, if if someone's going to drop two dollars on a book, they really had to know that this is going to be the quality book that they wanted, and to continue with it. Two dollars every time it comes out. Exactly. Yep. At least that—that's my operating theory. Yeah. And and certainly back in in that time, and I think you're seeing that reflected in today's mm -hmm. independent market. Right. Because um, it seems to me now I'm not an expert on what Marvel and DC is doing because I can't read them. Yeah. I just by page three I'm bored to tears. But I'm old school. Exactly. They're not doing them for me. Right. I would presume they know their market. Mm -hmm. Although I think a case might be made that they don't. That's them. They can do what they want. Their characters, their ballpark. Right. You know, go play. If you don't not put anybody in the seats, it's not my problem. But it's like, you know, with, with the independents, I think across the board, they, there was a huge amount of terrific books that they were doing then. Oh, yeah. Willingham's Elementals, Mage. Mm -hmm. The list goes on and on. Yep. Really, really good stuff. I, I want to ask quickly, because you just really brought up an interesting point about the difference between today's writers and, and like you said, old school writers. If you had your opportunity, would you rather have had a two to three year run on one book or to be able to jump from book to book to book and do a little bit or, you know, maybe a, one arc per book and then just move to a different one? Um, I would pref have preferred to have stayed okay. on the book. Um, I would say this now, likely had this happened, I would have a different outlook, mm -hmm. but um, I'd be happy if I was still able to do Daredevil today. Yeah. Now, I'm sure I would have run dry on a, you know, at some point way in the past, and it would be time to, you know, put me out the pasture and get somebody else. But uh, when they did it, I think they were a little bit um, premature. Did you ever stop with the book? Did you ever find yourself hitting that wall on a on a book and be like, you know what? I just I can't come up with anything new for this. Maybe it's time for me 
to walk away? Uh, no. Okay. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. I, no, I just, and, and one thing I'll speak for me, but I'm pretty sure I'm speaking for, for my contemporaries back in the day, at least for a great majority of them. Um, when we were doing Captain America and Daredevil and, and, and the Fantastic Four and X-Men and all, the creators, Stan and Jack and Steve Ditko and, and, and all these guys were still alive, still there. The last thing I wanted to do was embarrass them. Yeah. And I think that's probably maybe a part of what's missing today. Because there, there's, I had a connection mm -hmm. with those true giants in the industry right. that the 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 new writers today and the writers don't have. Right. So I think that's a part of it. Did you feel the weight of that doing Captain America? Yes, very much so. And how do you how do you work through it? You try not to embarrass yourself. No. You do the best you can. Right. Now, I would never be a Stan Lee, and, and, and if I were able to draw, I'd never be a Jack Kirby. Mm -hmm. Um, What I did, you know, and, and we, we changed a little bit with Cap. Mm -hmm. You know, well, when I started on Captain America, he was in his 98-pound um, weakling. Mm -hmm run right he lost his he was just this puny guy and here's me off the turnip truck writing one of my two most favorite characters in comic books and wait he's 98 pound weakling no this ain't going so before that first story i wrote in he's back being captain america and everything's fine <laughs> rightfully so yeah, oh, well, I didn't want to write a ninety-eight pound. No, character. I wanted to write Captain America. I just want uh, one more thing. I just want to talk to you about is with you know you've worked with Pied Piper. You helped put that together. You've done a lot for independent comics, and nowadays you're seeing. I mean, you see it now on Facebook and other social media with the you know the GoFundmes and the right back and stuff like that. There's independent comics left and right. I mean, it's all over the place. Yeah. What do you think of this boom of independent books? And do you think this is sort of the future of the industry? It would seem to me that it is the future because where have they got to go? Um, between, you know, some, let's just say some, some not optimal business decisions by Marvel and DC and the whole COVID hysteria stuff we lost a whole lot of comic book shops. Mm -hmm. I think I, I saw somewhere, I don't know if, if these are actually accurate numbers, but I, I bet they're reflective. It went from like 6,000 to 1,200. Um, you can't do like I did as a kid and walk into Rexall or, or the grocery store and, and find spinner racks mm -hmm. with all the comics on them. The place to go now is the internet mm -hmm. and I think you're seeing a lot of guys doing extremely well and in the comics you're now able to run the gamut you can do the superheroes or the horror comics mm -hmm. the funny animal books right. you know but you know joke books anything goes westerns war comics you can do whatever you want to do and probably if if you got some some business acumen, you can probably find your niche. Right. It might take a little while, and also uh, I see it running the gamut from some really terrific art to just fan art stuff, yeah. and that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's perfectly fine. I think anybody that wants to to express themselves artistically, whether they're you know, really cut out to be a comic book artist or writer or not, go ahead and have some fun. Right. 
Now, are you going to get involved in it? Uh, I already am. Nice. Um, we've got a book that will be coming out the um, end of February. That's a um, Maui Mighty Comics. It's a book we've done um, for Maui Relief Fund. Okay. For Hawaii. Um, uh, it was spearheaded by, by Mort Todd. Okay. And um, he was the um, publisher of um, Charlton mm -hmm. Neo. And he put together some of our stories from back then, which hardly anybody seen. And is putting that out. And all the proceeds. Now it's going through Gemstone pub, Publishing. Okay. At, um, that diamond. Mm -hmm. So all the proceeds are going to the fund. Nice. Which is really cool. Um, I'm hard at work on on a revamp and reboot of Next Man. Oh. Right now. Um because he was um, always kind of ahead of the times. Yeah. When he short run back in, in the mid 80s. Mm -hmm. with the, the robots, you know, and all. Now we've got the AI and the robots. You know, we're, we're off the races with this. <laughs> he was seeing now, the future. The, the sad part of it is, so Vince, uh, my, my co creator and artist mm -hmm. at Kamiko, Vince passed away wow. a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, so he's gone, but not forgotten. Yeah. So he'll he'll continue to get his his credit. That's awesome. In the book, and um, the new artist is Ben Torres. Okay. And uh, he worked with me on the last Marvel story. Okay. I likely ever do, which was in their Daredevil annual number one back in two thousand sixteen. Okay. We had a, like a 10 page story. Nice. Which, um, and, and the show, he kind of maybe the state of the industry, even at that time. Right. Um, you know, oh, great. You know, Roger, you know, come right. And then it turns out it's not a book, it's a 10 page story. Well, okay. And they offered me the same page rate mm -hmm. that I had back in the 80s. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. You know what I said? Not a word. Yeah. I wasn't doing it. I'd have probably paid them. Now don't don't tell them that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to write one more Daredevil story. Yeah. And was it the story that you get out, the story that you wanted to do? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I did. And we are back. Uh, that was a, a wonderful interview. I, I want to have Roger back. Like he said at the end, he has some more stuff coming up to talk to us about. Uh, when that happens, we're going to get him right back on. Uh, just uh, his run on Daredevil kind of changed the the whole trajectory of the character of the book and led to people like Frank Miller and Ascenti, um, our friend D uh, D.G. Chichester, taking the character in sort of darker places, which is a fine thing to do. So, uh, Roger, thank you again for coming on. Can't wait to have you back. Can't wait to hear you guys, uh, what you thought about this uh, interview. Remember, rate, review, subscribe, let us know, and we will see you on Friday. Mm -hmm.